If you want to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 34. There's a number of unpleasant stories in the Bible, and it can be a little difficult to find Christ or the grace in them, but uh, there is Christ all throughout the Bible in the Old Testament, and uh, we are going to find that here this evening. Now Dinah, Genesis 34, the daughter of Leah, had born born to Jacob, went out to visit the woman of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and violated her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. And Shechem said to his father, Hamor, get me this girl as my wife. When Jacob heard that his daughter Dinah had been defiled, His sons were in the fields with his livestock, so he kept quiet about it until they came home. Then Shechem's father Hamor went out to talk with Jacob. Now Jacob's sons had come in from the fields as soon as they heard what had happened. They were filled with grief and fury because Shechem had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing that should not be done. But Hamor said to Shechem, My son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters for yourselves. You can settle among us. The land is open to you. Live in it, trade in it, and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and I will give you whatever you ask. Make the price for the bride and the gift I am to bring as great as you like, and I'll pay whatever you ask me. Only give me the girl as my wife. Because their sister Dinah had been defiled, Jacob's sons replied deceitfully as they spoke to Shechem and his father Hamor. They said to them, We can't do such a thing. We can't give our sister to a man who is not circumcised. That would be a disgrace to us. We will give our consent to you on one condition only, that you become like us by circumcising all your males. Then we will give you our daughter and take your daughters for ourselves. We'll settle among you and become one people with you. But if you will not agree to be circumcised, we'll take our sister and go. Their proposal seemed good to Hamor and his son Shechem. The young man, who was the most honored of all his father's household, lost no time in doing what they said because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. So Hamor and his son Shechem went to the city of the gate of their city to speak to their fellow townsmen. These men are friendly toward us, they said. Let them live in our land and trade in it. The land has plenty of room for them. We can marry their daughters and they can marry ours. But the men will consent to live with us as one people only on the condition that our males be circumcised, as they themselves are. Won't their livestock, their property, and all other animals become ours? So let us give our consent to them, and they will settle among us. All the men who went out of the city gate agreed with Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male in the city was circumcised. Three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. The sons of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and looted the city where their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and donkeys and everything else of theirs in the city and out of the fields. They carried off all their wealth and all their women and children, taking as plunder everything in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me a stench to the Canaanites and Perizzites, the people living in this land. We are few in number, and if they join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. 
But they replied, should he have treated our sister like a prostitute? One of many unpleasant stories of the Bible where you have to wonder, where's the grace here? Where is Christ here? Well, let's just go over the story point by point. What happened? If you're following on the outlines here, what happened? Dinah was raped by Shechem, who was a prominent prince. He was the most honored, he said, of all of the sons of Hamor. And it, in the Hebrew there, when it says that uh, he violated her, it literally means he humbled her. He humbled her. It was disgraceful. And then, somehow, Shechem falls in love with Dinah and wants her as his wife. It literally says in the Hebrew the same thing it says in Genesis 2 when it says a man will leave his father and mother and he will cling to his wife. It says here that where it says his heart was drawn to Dinah, it says his heart clung to her. His heart clung to her. And then Dinah's brothers are enraged. They want justice. And it's not hard to see why. If you have a sister or a daughter or a mother, it's not too hard to see why they would be so angry at what happened. Justice needs to be done here. We are not just going to look the other way. I mean, even the narrator says in verse 7, a thing that should not be done. The narrator doesn't always comment on the things that happen. Sometimes there's just the story. But here, this is a thing that should not be done. So Shechem tries to persuade Dinah's family with money. He's a wealthy guy. He has a lot of money to give. And so he throws out money at him. Now bridal gifts were customary back then. You, you paid a bride price. But Shechem is what he's trying to do. He's essentially trying to ignore the wrong that he has done and kind of buy his way out of it. And get away with it. Dinah's brothers, their only demand is that all the city's males be circumcised. For them, it's not about the money at all. They're not people about, about the money. It's about honor. It's about honor and respect and what's right and what's wrong. So they demand that all the city's males be circumcised. Now, make an, I want to make a note of this. Circumcision is a sign of belonging to God's covenant people. Being circumcised means that you belong to God's people, God's family, his household. So they said, if we are going to intermarry with you, then you have to be circumcised. So that's their only demand. While the entire city was in pain, it says on the third day, I, I read as I was studying here that the third day for circumcision is apparently when the pain is at its worst. And uh, I'm mighty thankful I was circumcised as, a, as an infant and I don't remember that. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, while the entire city was in pain, Simeon and Levi slaughter the entire city. They go and slaughter the entire city. So here we have a story about rape and deception and revenge. Where is Christ here? Where is grace here? Why would God put this story in his word? Well, he must have put it there for a reason, because it's here. The only way to find out is if we 
dive into it. So where is Christ and the grace? Well, not unlike Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, God is also very furious about sin and the loss of human innocence. Sin is not something that's just, eh, we can look the other way or we can let that go. God is furious about it. We talk about the wrath of God. And as Simeon and Levi were furious about the rape of their sister, God, when he lost Adam and Eve in the garden to sin, became like a bear, mother bear robbed of her cubs. And this is not going to end well. So when God lost us to sin, Christ set out to restore our honor. God lost us to sin. We were humbled by sin. Just like Dinah was humbled by what happened to her. We were shamed. Just like Adam and Eve when... They sinned, they realized they were naked, and they hid themselves. It was a shameful thing. It was dishonorable. Christ, when he came, came to restore our honor, to wipe that sin away, so that when we stand before God, we need not be ashamed anymore. So, by comparison, God... Made it, well, also, God also made an end to the serpent who did this. So just like Simeon and Levi go and slaughter the town, the perpetrators, God says to the serpent first, Cursed are you above all livestock. You will crawl on your belly for the rest of your days. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike at his heel. In other words, serpent, you are going to end. So right now would be kind of like the three days where the perpetrators... Satan is still around, still at large, in pain, but there's a final punishment that's coming. Now, Simeon and Levi, we're going to talk about what they did wrong, but they did do one thing right. To speak in their favor, Simeon and Levi brought justice in defense of their sister. They did bring justice where there was none. They did stand up for what's right when a wrong had been done. And not in the same way, but in a similar way, we need to stand up for people who are mistreated. When we encounter people who are being taken advantage of, when the strong are preying on the weak, We need to do something. The strong prey on the weak constantly, and that is true from all the way in Wall Street to every school playground. Bigger people pick on littler people. And so we need to stand up for people who can't defend or stand up for themselves. Uh, as a teacher uh, and uh, as a pastor myself, uh, legally we are called mandatory reporters. So if we encounter a child who is being abused, we are required by law to report that. As believers, We are mandatory reporters when someone is victimized. God's law requires that we stand up for people and intervene if something is going wrong. Now, that doesn't mean we go on a killing spree like they did. That's not the idea at all. But if there are children 
that you know of next door who are being abused or neglected, you're a mandatory reporter. If somebody is fired and you know that this person was let go under false pretenses, say something. Bring the truth up. When somebody is being taken advantage of, we need to stand up for them. Simeon and Levi did do that. It brought justice where there was none. But Simeon and Levi's vengeance exceeded the crime. So, it was really vengeance more than justice. The entire city for what one person done. So, for us, in our case, we might be at times very angry about certain things that are done wrong, whether to us or to somebody near us. And we get angry and we feel like there's this righteous anger. Like God has been violated. Not just this person I love, but God has been violated too. But in our righteous wrath against sin, do we forget mercy? Simeon and Levi did. In Habakkuk, in the final chapter, he prays to the Lord, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day. and our time, make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. A God is a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy. And there's a time to be angry at what's wrong in the world. And there's plenty of wrong to be angry about. But there's also a mercy that we have to balance it with. So, when the state executes a felon, it's not appropriate for us to rejoice. I remember there was this show, I don't even remember which show it was, but every time there was somebody executed, for a crime on this particular radio show, they would have a toilet flush. And this, this uh, announcer would say, goodbye to another loser, jerk, person, refuse of society. That's not appropriate for us. When bullies get their consequences, and bullies usually end up getting their consequences, would we rub it in? Would we mock them in their humiliation? God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, so how is it appropriate for us to be happy when someone else gets what's deserved? God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. So when somebody else gets what they deserve, it's not appropriate for us to jump up and down or point in their face and saying, you got what was coming to you. Take that, you loser, or whatever. That's not our, that's not our business to do that. Sin turned God into a mama bear robbed of her cubs, and yet he remembers mercy. If God was only a God of justice, he would have destroyed us all and started a new one. But God is not just a God of justice, he's also a God of mercy. So Simeon and Levi went farther than justice required, but worst of all, they used God's holy sign of the covenant to deceive and harm. They used God's sign of salvation, a sign of grace, to destroy. 
And because of this, the family blessing passed to their younger brother. When Jacob was blessing his sons in Genesis 49, he said, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Their descendants would be dispersed. And yet, God did not completely reject them. Levi ended up inheriting the priesthood of Israel. And even though they had no land, they were scattered everywhere. Simeon did get some land, and they ended up disappearing, but they disappeared into the tribe of Judah. So they became part of God's plan of redemption, the tribe of the blessing. Again, circumcision is a covenant of grace that was God's covenant of grace, which we have now practice as baptism. It marks people as God, God's token of covenant relationship. So for us, do we as Christians preach grace and then use our tongues to harm? Do we talk about grace and then do our tongues become swords that pierce other people? Proverbs 12, verse 18, Reckless words pierce like a sword. And there are things that some of us can say that will never be forgotten because it hurts so bad. Do we preach grace and then use our tongues to harm? And do we preach Christ and then take advantage of other people? Do we preach Christ while taking advantage of other people? Do we make somebody else's loss our gain? Do we just look the other way? If we're preaching Christ, then we need to live like Christ. If we are walking in His image after His footsteps, then our lives should reflect that. So the final point, getting justice may be satisfying. But we preach Christ crucified and injustice from God's mercy for our benefit. We preach Christ crucified, which was an injustice. It was, he did not deserve to die, we deserve to die. And in that sense, it was an injustice. But it was because of God's mercy. And it was for our benefit. So as you go into this week, don't just think of justice. Remember mercy. And if you preach Christ crucified, be ready not only to show justice, but also to show mercy. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, O oh Lord, you are God of justice, but you have shown us mercy. And Lord, what, a, what an amazing thing that is, that even though we deserve to die, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we would be saved. We pray, Lord, that we would truly reflect you, that, Lord, we would be people of justice, that we would stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves, that we would intervene when strong people 
take advantage of weak people. But Lord, remind us of mercy constantly. The mercy that you showed us, especially on the cross, which even though it was not in strictest of justice, it was your mercy and it saved us. It took our sins away. Remind us of that, Lord, always. In Jesus' name, amen.